Wheeland Presley Funeral Home and Crematory have been serving Quad City families and veterans since 1889. Wheeland Presley Funeral Homes are located in Rock Island, Milan, and Reynolds, and are proud supporters of WQPT. Alternatives is a proud supporter of WQPT and has been serving our community for 40 years. Alternatives provides professional guidance to maintain independence and quality of life for older adults and adults with disabilities. The race for the newly drawn Iowa 1st Congressional District pits a Democratic newcomer against a Republican freshman. We'll talk with Christina Bohannon on The Cities. Iowa and the rest of the United States redrew its congressional lines after the 2020 census, and this is the first test of these new borders. The new Iowa first includes all of southeast Iowa, from the Quad Cities in Maquoketa to Burlington and Keokuk. It now also stretches to Indianola near Des Moines and includes Iowa City. But cities like Cedar Rapids, Waterloo, and Ottumwa are no longer in the district. Republican Marionette Miller-Meeks is running for re-election in the first, moving her official residence out of Ottumwa. Democratic State Representative Christina Bohannon is her opponent. Bohannon is a law professor at the University of Iowa, and we talked with a state representative about her campaign and the issues impacting people in Iowa's first. So why did you decide to run? And tell me a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so I ran for Congress because I love Iowa. You know, Iowa is such a special place. When I came here uh, 23 years ago, it just gave me a great job, wonderful communities to raise my school, uh, wonderful community to raise my daughter, great schools for her to go to. Uh, and so it's just been such a wonderful place to live. And as I've been going all over the district, uh, I see people who love Iowa and they are working really, really hard, but a lot of them are not really getting a fair shot to get ahead. And that's something I really understand, you know, because I, I grew up in a very tiny town I grew up in a trailer off of a dirt road. Neither of my parents graduated high school. My dad was a construction worker. And uh, things were really tough for a while. You know, I actually, I tell people that one of my uh, happiest memories is the day that we got our double wide. Because when we got our double wide, we literally had twice as much space as before. And it just felt like we had died and gone to heaven. And it was in the 70s, so it had that burnt orange shag carpet, you know, so we really thought we were in style. Um, but one of the hardest days of my life was when my dad had been sick for a long time. He had emphysema. And just as he was getting really, really sick, his health insurance was canceled. And we had never had much before that, but when that happened, we really lost everything. Uh, we had no choices. And, and I see people all over Southeast Iowa who love to be here, they want to be here, uh, they're working really, really hard, but a lot of them are, are having some of the same struggles and aren't getting a fair shot. So I'm, I'm running for them. You are new to politics. You only entered the uh, state uh, uh, house two years ago in mm -hmm. a campaign in uh, Iowa City. Mm -hmm. Why now? Why do you think that you're ready to be a, a congressperson, a representative mm -hmm. for Southeast Iowa? Yeah. You know, I think the biggest thing is caring about people and really wanting to work for them. And I, I think the biggest issue we have right now is uh, extreme party politics, uh, corporate special interests, putting those things ahead of the people that you represent. And that is what people care about the most. And so for me, uh, I have great experience from the State House. I've, I've worked on a number of bills. I've uh, worked in a bipartisan way on a number of bills that I'm really proud of. Uh, and I've stood up to some things that I thought were, were bad for Iowans. Uh, but I think the main thing is to really put the people first and to understand what people are going through. And unfortunately, I think right now there are too many people who are you know, putting uh, what their party line tells them to do or what the corporate special interests want them to do instead of really focusing on making everyday Iowans' lives better. Well, let's talk about some of those issues. Yeah. Uh, you, you support a number of the Biden administration initiatives, which are costing hundreds of billions of dollars. What is your fear about it, the impact on inflation? So I think that uh, I, I think we have to think about inflation. You know, inflation is 
a real challenge right now. People are really feeling that. Uh, and so what we have to do is make sure that whatever we do, uh, that we keep that in mind, that we keep costs low. A number of the, you know, I, and I don't agree with the Biden administration on everything. I will tell you that right now. I have my own feelings about a number of things. Um, I'm pretty independent. You know, I ran against a 20-year incumbent of my own party. Uh, and so I am not beholden to any political party or any corporation when I think about policy. Um, but there are some things that are good for Iowa. And that is the main thing that anyone representing Iowa should be thinking about. Not which political party recommended something or sponsored legislation, but what it's going to do for the people of our own state. And so when we think about some of the things that I do agree with, the infrastructure bill is going to be fantastic for Iowa. It is going to uh, repair roads and bridges, build new ones. It's going to help with locks and dams. That transportation efficiency is really going to solve supply chain problems. And it's going to create great jobs here in Iowa for many years to come. So I think the infrastructure bill is great. Uh, my opponent, Marionette Miller-Meeks, voted against that bill. I don't think that's a defensible position for someone who's putting Iowans first. Well, and also, as, as people may know is that you work at the University of Iowa. You are in the uh, uh, School of uh, Law, a professor there. You do know also of uh, uh, um, forgiveness of student loans that is going on right now. Uh, you have said that you didn't want a across the board forgiveness of student loans. What the Biden administration has proposed, is this pretty much aligns with exactly what you think should happen? And what do you think is going to be the impact? Yeah, so, so that's a great question. And yes, I mean, you know, for me, I was the first one in my family to go to college. You know, neither of my parents graduated high school. Uh, college education lifted me up, gave me opportunities. I want that for, for all people and all Iowans, um, if, if that's what they choose. You know, at the same time, I also fully support uh, trade school, vocational skills, apprenticeships, those kinds of things, community college. All of that is part of the big picture. Um, what we have with student loan debt is you know, we have to make college more affordable across the board. You know, our college tuition in Iowa is about six times what it was when I went to college. That is a huge increase, and that's not just inflation. Uh, so, you know, that is, that's my first and foremost concern, is making college more affordable for everybody. But at the same time, more people are choosing not to go to four-year institutions mm -hmm. because of that expense and also the belief that you don't get necessarily the biggest bang for the buck by investing in a college education. Right. And, and so, so, and that's absolutely fine. You know, we need more skilled workers in Iowa. That is really important. And so not everybody needs to get a college education. Um, I think, you know, community college partnerships with apprenticeships and skills training is really important. I think we need to invest in that. Uh, so absolutely. Um, for those who want to go to college, I would like to make that more affordable. You know, I know from my own experience that being a first generation college goer, uh, it, was, it was really intimidating. And I think I've talked to a lot of students who I've taught who are first generation for whom, you know, it was really scary. And the idea of taking on debt was, was you know, really frightening. And so uh, we need to make sure that that is affordable. I would like to see very targeted student debt relief. Uh, the thing that we need to think about is I absolutely do not think that uh, you know, low-income people should be subsidizing high-income people when it comes to student debt. Uh, Blue-collar workers should not be subsidizing white-collar workers, right? Um, so for me, that's why I would like to see this targeted. I am glad that what was proposed uh, does target more low-income people to, to provide that debt relief. I think that's important. Um, but I would like to see it maybe even more targeted. We could look at uh, first-generation college goers. We could uh, also focus debt relief on some of those areas that Iowa really needs. So teachers, nurses, you know, other, other skilled uh, workers who um, are going to work in underserved areas of Iowa, I think those would be really good places for some targeted debt relief. Let's talk about women's health and, of course, reproductive rights. <clears throat> as you well know, the impact of Roe v. Wade is going to weigh heavily on this campaign as well as on politics. Uh, H.R. 8296, Women's Health Protection Act of 2022, Democrats passed that, um, basically preventing states from prohibiting abortion before 24 weeks. Uh, it's got no chance of passage, of course, in the Senate. What do you, would you have supported that, first of all? And, and what do you think is appropriate as far as abortion rights in America? Right. So this is a, about a lot more than just abortion. You know, this is about women. 
This is about the right to control our own bodies. It's about our privacy, our freedom, and not being second-class citizens. And uh, there are a lot of issues here where you know, women's health is really threatened if we don't allow termination of pregnancy in some cases. There, this is a very serious issue. And so for me, what I really think would be appropriate would be to go back to the framework that was in place for 50 years that served us well. It had a framework, it had some limitations. It wasn't you know, abortion on demand up until birth. That's a silly thing, nobody is really advocating for that. That's just a talking point people use. The law that we had in place worked well for 50 years. I think we need to go back to that framework. My opponent, Marionette Miller Meeks, sponsored a bill in Congress called a Life at Conception bill that would ban abortion nationwide without any exceptions for rape, incest, or to save the life of the mother, beginning at the moment of conception. That is not where people are in Iowa. It's very bad for women. It's a, a, a major problem for our privacy, for our autonomy, and it's going to be very bad for Iowans. And I'll tell you, a lot of the Republicans have signed on to that bill. So if uh, she is reelected and others are reelected, I fully expect that that's what they're going to pursue. And I do not think that's what Iowans want. We've been talking about campaigns as well um, and the use of social media. Misinformation has always been a, a major concern, particularly in the last two election cycles. What do you think needs to be done as far as uh, curbing use of social media when it comes to whatever you characterize as misinformation? You, being a college professor, know the importance of the First Amendment. You have to, you have to balance those rights. Where is that balance right now? I think that's one of the important issues of our time and, and certainly in our politics. Uh, misinformation is a major problem. I mean, you know, we, we love a debate and, and uh, you know, we love to get our message out and make sure that we educate people. Uh, but the fact is that when there's so much misinformation out there, it makes it really hard for our democracy to work the way that it's supposed to. Um, having said that, I will tell you I am a very staunch First Amendment supporter. Um, I fully believe in First Amendment rights for people to speak even when they don't agree with me. I think that's a, a, a fundamental principle uh, of, of our society, of our government, of our democracy. So um, I am very, very hesitant to uh, limit First Amendment rights. Uh, I think this is going to be an ongoing debate, an ongoing issue about when it's appropriate and what kinds of harms we need to deal with. Uh, certainly when we're talking about anything advocating violence, uh, we really need to take a look at that. And we have seen that social media has played a role in, in some very violent uh, types of, of events. Well, and at this point, I mean, the onus is really on the companies, on Facebook, on Twitter, to police itself. I mean, that's why I'm wondering, what is the role of the government then? Right. So, so I think that um, these are private companies. And uh, you know, they are going to have to take uh, an active role in policing their own, according to their own terms and their own contract. Uh, I think that is, that is going to be an ongoing uh, debate about whether the government should have any role in that. But I will say, I think that we have to tread very carefully when we start to talk about the government intervention in, in, in speech um, and make sure that whatever we do is going to have a very limited effect and not have a broader effect on people's ability to, um, to debate uh, different issues. I know you're running for Congress for Southeast Iowa, but you are going to face some international issues as well. You talk about Ukraine and the impact of, of the war in Ukraine, more billions of dollars going there, more uh, of, of from the coffers of Iowans. Uh, you also have the possibility that the United States may have to get somehow involved with the protection of Taiwan, depending upon what China does. Let's start with Taiwan. What should be the policy for the U.S.? I mean, what do you think could be as far as a confrontation with China? Well, I think that that is uh, that's a, certainly a major foreign policy issue at this moment. And um, I think that we have to think about what the United States' interests are there. And I do think that with both Taiwan and Ukraine, there are major concerns about democracy around the world. Uh, I think that we have to uh, stand up to Putin uh, with the war in Ukraine because if, you know, if we allow that to continue, then you know, that might embolden a country like China uh, to invade uh, Taiwan. And that's certainly been a threat for a very long time. You know, my major concern with something like this is what are the effects going to be on the United States and our democracy? And so, for example, the, there was a bill that came through Congress not long ago, uh, the CHIPS Act, which is about semiconductor manufacturing and bringing 
semiconductor manufacturing back to the United States, including potentially back to places like Iowa. You know, that was a great bill because about 90% of our military grade semiconductors are manufactured in Taiwan. If you have an invasion from China into Taiwan, uh, that could really cripple our military. Uh, so I uh, did support that bill, the CHIPS Act, that would bring semiconductor manufacturing back to the United States. It would make our, our national security uh, better and, and more protected. It would uh, bring great jobs to places like the United States, including, uh, I'm sorry, great jobs to places like Iowa. And I think that's a really great opportunity for Iowa. And it would also solve supply chain problems on a whole variety of products that have semiconductors in them. So when I think about these national security issues, I'm primarily thinking about what is going to be the impact on the United States and on Iowa. And we need to think about good policy that makes us less uh, vulnerable and more resilient to these kinds of events around the world. And so, you know, again, the CHIPS Act, I think, was a good one. Marionette Miller Meeks voted against that. I don't think that was a good vote for Iowa. Uh, also, when we think about that, we have to think about becoming more uh, fuel uh, independent because we cannot be vulnerable to places like Russia, places like the Middle East for our oil, for uh, our energy. And so, um, you know, making us more energy independent. Uh, moving more toward renewable fuels, toward um, you know greener energy. Those are not only important things for the United States to do for our economy, for our national security, but they're also great opportunities for Iowa. You know because Iowa has already invested in renewable fuels. We're already doing solar and wind energy. Investments in green energy are going to be great opportunities for Iowa to become a national leader in some of those things, while also reducing our deficit and uh, making the United States more energy independent. I want to get back to that, but let's stick up for a minute longer as far as uh, international affairs mm -hmm. are concerned. And, and this is a little bit in the weeds, but it affects Iowa farmers is issues involving trade, but also such things as, believe it or not, fertilizer. Um, the, the United States has a protection for uh, a natural uh, a national uh, fertilizer protection as opposed to Moroccan fertilization coming here and nitrogen. It's very complicated, but once again, it's interlocking with all these different nations. And, and, and Secretary Vilsack, Agriculture Secretary Vilsack, saying the administration is working on it. What do you want to see as far as international trade is for farmers? Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. as you well know, I mean, farmers want to sell their crops yes. everywhere. Yes, absolutely. And we need to make it so that our farmers can sell their crops everywhere. You know, I, I think that. Um, a lot of the barriers to that are real problems for Iowa farmers. And I think first and foremost, Iowa farmers really want to, uh, they have a product, they've worked hard on it, they want to sell it. You know, they don't want to just rely on other kinds of subsidies and things like that. They want to be able to do their work and to sell those products. So we need to look for those opportunities um, and not throw up unnecessary barriers uh, to that. Um, you know, as far as fertilizers and things like that, I I I'll tell you that what we're seeing right now is that we have major concentration in industries like fertilizer, like seed, um, you know, market concentration that makes those products cost very, very high for farmers. Um, and that is really putting the squeeze on Iowa farmers. You know, Iowa farmers are resilient, they're resourceful, uh, but they are making less on their crops now than they have in decades. You know, most of them are having to supplement their income from the farm with other things, especially smaller, smaller farms. Um, and so that is something that we absolutely have to work on. And um, I think that we need to uh, think about what our competition policy is around things like seeds and uh, seed and fertilizer, uh, make sure that those markets are competitive and that our farmers are, are paying a fair price for those kinds of things. At the same time, you know, we need to invest in some things where our Iowa farmers can really shine and benefit. And so, for example, uh, there are some things in the Inflation Reduction Act that was just passed uh, that would provide direct incentives to farmers for things like, uh, uh, you know, uh, cro uh, cover crops and you know other kinds of conservation practices. And so, um, 
only 60% of our farmers who applied for those incentives before were getting them. And this is a new investment in those incentives so that more of our Iowa farmers can take advantage of that. So there are a lot of things that we can invest in to um, you know, get Iowa farmers a, a profit out of the, the practices that they're engaging in while also uh, you know, expanding the markets for uh, their, their crops. I know you're a big supporter of the infrastructure bill that was passed. I think it's a $1.2 trillion <laughs> bill. Um, and as you well know also, as California is now calling, for uh, all electric or hydrogen, just non-gas fossil fuel cars mm -hmm. by uh, 2035. Is that the right direction? Is that that the state or the federal government needs to mandate how quickly uh, Americans convert to the new technology as far as uh, emission-free vehicles? I don't think m in most cases we need to mandate, and I don't see Iowa doing that. Um, I think what we need to do is create the infrastructure and um, provide the incentives and let, let things go from there, and I think we will get to where we need to go. Uh, we do need to invest in infrastructure, charging stations, things like that. You know, this recent bill I mentioned um, invests a huge amount of money in biofuels, infrastructure, storage, treatment, those kinds of things. Again, those are going to be things that are great for Iowa. You know, this, this Inflation <laughs> Reduction Act, I mean, it's almost like it was written for Iowa. I don't think there's any state that's going to benefit more from that than Iowa will. Um, with all of the investments in biofuels and energy independence, uh, those kinds of things, it's going to be, and, and, then, and then we haven't even talked about the health care piece, right, which really does reduce health care costs for Iowans. That's something I hear a lot about as I'm going all over Southeast Iowa. You know, people are just spending way too much of their money, their paychecks or their uh, Social Security benefits or whatever on uh, out-of-pocket health care expenses on premiums. And uh, this recent bill is going to bring those costs down uh, for Iowans. And that's, uh, that's a really good thing. What do you hope to be as far as once you're elected? Uh, what committee assignment what, that, that you want? What is your priority? What do you want to do from day one? Mm -hmm. I love that. I, that's a great question. Um, so, you know, I've been thinking about a, lo a, a lot about that, and I don't uh, think I have an answer exactly yet in terms of what committee I would want to do. Uh, but, but I would maybe want to do something in energy and commerce, uh, something around there, something that would allow me to work on really reinvesting in our small towns, uh, in our economies. Uh, you know, I think that we have to work on things like uh, rural health care. Uh, that is a huge problem. People are having to drive an hour to, um, you know, see a doctor or to fill a prescription. You know, I think that that's really hard for us to maintain our small towns, and we are in fact seeing two-thirds of our counties lose population around things like school closures and health care concerns and uh, lack of opportunity. So I really want to work on increasing opportunities, uh, bringing great jobs to some of our smaller towns, manufacturing. That's why I mentioned the semiconductor uh, bill, which I think could be a great opportunity for Iowa. Uh, the green energy stuff, you know, I think that that's a really great um, opportunity for expansion for Iowa. So I would really want to work on some things that would um, allow us to rebuild our economies in some of our smaller communities, and also um, as well as you know in in other places. You know, I, I've come over and talked to business leaders in the Quad Cities area, and I've talked to them about what they need and what they're seeing. And so uh, I, I would just want to really consult with people right off the bat on day one, see what people here need, and be laser focused on working on those things. Um, you know, and, and and not so much on doing whatever my party leader tells me to do or whatever some corporate special interests want me to do. But in so many different ways, it will be very partisan, no matter what happens. If the Democrats can hold on to the House, if the Republicans uh, uh, reclaim the House, you say that, that you do work across party lines. You're not beholden to anyone. But once people get to Washington, the pressure is so hard to vote on a certain way. You really do believe that you're going to remain independent? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because, you know, Look, my district is my district, and first of all, my, my main priority is to go around, talk to people, hear what is happening in their lives, and then go and, and just be laser focused on doing that work. Uh, my job is not to you know, bring in the most money or to try to be on television as much as possible, no, no offense, <laughs> but that, that's not what this job is supposed to be. And unfortunately, that is what we see happening in Washington right now is that people, you know, they get elected with the best of intentions, perhaps, 
but then they go to Washington and it's kind of, it becomes a circus. You know, it's all about getting on a certain news program or raising the most money or uh, being the best friend to certain powerful special interests or just following your party line, whatever they tell you to do. And I think that is killing our country. And I'll tell you right now, it is not good for Iowa. You know, in, in Iowa, people have real problems. They have real issues that they are dealing with every single day. And we need someone who is going to look out for them. And that is what I'm going to be about. I have shown a lot of independence in my own party already. Uh, I am not beholden to any political party or any uh, corporation. Our thanks to State Representative Christina Bohannon, the Democratic candidate for the 1st Congressional District in Iowa. State Representative Bohannon will face U.S. Representative Marionette Miller Meeks in November. I'll have a program note in a moment, but first, here's Laura Adams, Out and About. This is Out and About for September 23rd to 29th. Bishop Hill's annual 19th Century Harvest Festival, Jordbruksdagena, takes place the 24th and 25th with traditional craft demonstrations, food, vendors, and more. Run through five cities, two states, and across four bridges at the Quad Cities Marathon starting in Moline. Plus, Our Lady of the Prairie host Prairie Fest in Wheatland, Iowa, the 24th from 11 to 4. Shop for everything and more at Rock Island's Fall Community Garage Sale in Longview Park on the 20th fourth from eight to two and Riverside United Methodist Church host the Riverside Fall Fest the 25th from two to five in Moline. It's time to celebrate the Kelowna Fall Festival at the Kelowna Historical Village where there's something for everyone on the 23rd and 24th from nine to nine. Music on the Mississippi with Troy Wrangell and friends perform at the Ben Butterworth East Shelter on the 26th. Danica and the Jeb perform at Tanglewood on the 23rd at seven. RMEs Live at Five present the Jordan Danielson Band on the 23rd and Orangadang on the 30th starting at 5. Clue, a fun-filled musical where the audience solves the mystery of whodunit continues on the Circa 21 stage and GIT Improv returns to the Black Box Theater in downtown Moline for an evening of hilarity. Tickets are $10 at the door on the 24th at 7.30. For more information visit wqpt.org. Thank you, Laura. WQPT is airing interviews in the coming weeks with all four candidates running for the two congressional seats directly impacting the cities. We'll also air those discussions the weekend before the election. On the air, on the radio, on the web, on your mobile device, and streaming on your computer, thanks for taking some time to join us as we talk about the issues on the cities. Wheeland Presley Funeral Home and Crematory have been serving Quad City families and veterans since 1889. Wheeland Presley Funeral Homes are located in Rock Island, Milan, and Reynolds, and are proud supporters of WQPT. Alternatives is a proud supporter of WQPT and has been serving our community for 40 years. Alternatives provides professional guidance to maintain independence and quality of life for older adults and adults with disabilities.